perspectives, different views, one voice. Welcome to the LDM Perspective Podcast. Uh, my name is Cam. I'm in the studio with my friends, Mo, Ali, Kojo. I like the whole friends stuff, you know. We could, could say co hosts and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> friends. We're actually friends. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, today we're discussing life after Brexit. It's t- today's the 2nd of February. UK left the EU officially on the 31st of January. And so we're here to discuss uh, what life um, will be like following um, our our, um, exit from the EU. So before we dive into this topic of life after Brexit, we're just going to sort of just have a general discussion and just, how's everyone doing? How's everyone's week? I'm I'm upset. You lot don't believe I'm vegan. (laughs) Yeah, I'm good, man. (laughs) Me, he's talking about I'm I'm flexitarian. We're having this conversation. (laughs) Flexitarian. Flexitarian. Yes, I'm joking. (laughs) Flexitarian. Vegan. Um, just hashtag. Man, he needs to do a hashtag flexitarian. Man. <laughs> there might be a lot of people struggling that want to do it. I tried. I think with veganism as well, it's like it can be, you have to definitely plan your transition into veganism. Because otherwise, you could go to from one extreme to another. Your body can't handle the transition because it's too much of, of a shift. So it just shocks your body. Yeah. You know what? What I, mean? what I found is I think I need to be some animal hating person or something you know them people that loves animals and everyone that tries to eat them i hate them and stuff because i still love lamb lamb is my biggest weakness in life i think think, yeah lamb 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 i think i look at it with lust and objectify it and (laughs) i just want it and it's like (laughs) but you need to know the process of how you make lamb i need to hate it i need to hate it then you probably stop eating lamb you know i need to hate Ah. chicken that's the only way I can start I need to hate it yeah my weakness is chicken I think I could give everything else up other than chicken chicken is the hardest for me but I need to find a way to um, or to, to to not like it or just eat it in moderation so I sort of lower the amounts I have periodically until I get to a point where I'm just like I'm not having it anymore but you do know what they say about black people about chicken though no it's that can't stop yeah, I remember that Dave Chappelle skit where um, I think black people receive reparations yeah. and, and they said they said shares in chicken like fried chicken went up <laughs> 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 and it, that, that gave me a lot of jokes you know sort of like a bit of truth in that I guess <laughs> for me um, this week has been very hectic and um, still hectic now tomorrow another week again so trying to trying to say oh Stop moaning about it and get it done, you know, because that's the way of life, Frank. So the more we moan about it, the more it's not going to go our way. And sometimes you have to moan. It just makes you wake. It makes you feel alive, you know, you're a human being. Exactly. You know what I mean? Exactly. You, can't, you can't be just so set and just achieving stuff. Sometimes there are some difficulties that we'll have. It's just how we overcome those, I guess, isn't it? It's yeah, more important. Perspectives, isn't it? different views, one I point. think it's just some feedback, though. Everyone remembers coffee, right? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so Kofi shared this feedback with me a couple of weeks ago, actually, yeah. where he kind of mentioned, I think we went through a transition or we went through a period where we were having conversations about certain topics, but we were not actually bringing any specific statistics to support our argument. So we we're more talking from our viewpoint rather than what's kind of out there. And yeah. he kind of just mentioned that uh, he likes it when we bring some stats and talks about those stats as well as us sharing our own kind of ideas or our own kind of thinking behind it yeah so that's just something but i think of late a lot of the um episodes that we've done we've kind of actually brought a lot of statistical yeah. information as well so yeah. i think yeah there's something that we are kind of just start doing again so, perspectives yeah. different views one all right so let's dive into this topic life after brexit so as everyone's aware we had a referendum on the 21st of june 2016 UK voted to leave the EU and following on from that date um, extensive discussions have taken place with the UK government and the European Union to leave they managed to broker a deal um, and now the UK left on the 31st of January Uh, we're still in a transitional period so things will remain the same up until the 1st of January uh, 2021 so after that date then we'll see sort of a significant um, change in terms of the effects of leaving the EU but I wanted to start the topic off by talking maybe from our own perspectives about our views on Brexit and how we and you know let's start from this point 
Diddy trying to vote at the referendum in 2016. Let me start off with you, Mark. Yeah, <clears throat> so yeah, I definitely voted. Um, mainly because obviously I knew what the significance of it was and what it entailed. Um, I travel a lot in Europe. I do reap a lot of the benefits of having that European Union connection and that, um, uh, how they communicate and the, global, the globalization side of it in terms of I registered for a European health insurance card. So now that we're never going to go out there, I'm not the people that is fighting about getting travel insurance and things like that and how that's going to affect you if anything is happening abroad. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the other main reasons why I voted, because I have mentioned to you guys before that I abstained from voting. Oh, sorry, sorry. All right, um, yeah, so the other thing is that I voted mainly because it was a proper general election or a general vote in terms of each vote wasn't going to a local leader or whatever. It was literally counting for the whole thing. So every vote that you made was used specifically as a percentage of yes or no. Um, so, yeah, I revote, voted to remain and understood the benefits of remaining but I empathised with those that were unsure of what to vote because I felt the government didn't properly give clear examples of what it meant to vote, remain or to leave. OK, OK, Ali, what do you think? How, how did you vote? Did you vote? Yeah, I did. I voted and I voted to remain. As more already addressed to some of the key points, I, I knew what was the objective and um, the, the advantage and the disadvantage. However, I, I, I wanted to remain mainly because of um, I, I knew he was a benefit for all of us. And um, whether or not you're not British, whether or not you are another different country, I just realised that I know, understand the benefit. And um, But it was just funny how out on the sudden, when David Cameron just came in as in, in power, I wanted to just straight away jump into it. And I'm not understanding if this was just a co conso um I'm not understanding if this just was just a, a a way of tackling the immigration system or, or just being racism about it or or just wanted to have a, a control of the borders. Um, however... Nigel Farage wanted to just go on top of it and um, put more pressure into the situation. But for me, despite all of that, it was just good for as a neighbour to be able to go to France or, or Portugal or wherever part of Europe and just be part of it because as mom already addressed it, I travel quite a lot as well in Europe and um, it was also a benefit for me. However, now I don't know what the impact is going to take and how it's going to involve and affect us. From from the the, the look of it, I it might be a struggle for now, but United Kingdom will be good and has been, and um, especially I work in an industry where it's very effective. It's going to be very effective for us in the industry, which is construction. 80% I will mention our workers are Europeans, 80%. And the uh, rest of it, the 2% is mainly like the English, which are more of the managers. And the 20%. The, 20%, mm. yeah, which are the, 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 the directors and, uh, and, uh, and the managers. So the, the effectiveness of it is that they are more of the labor side, the yeah. operative side, and they don't want to actually do the grinding and the work. And the 20% are not the ones that are actually working. So that's the effectiveness. Of, I'm going to see how, how that's going to look into our eyes. And it might affect quite a lot of ten tender and bidding and trying to win the project and so on because there's not enough efficiency, labor or operative to able to manage to do the work. So that's the only side of it. But in general, I think it will be good. I just wanted to see how it's going to affect us within a decade from now. What about you, Coach? What do you think? But in fact, did you vote yeah, in the referendum? Actually, yeah, I did definitely vote for the referendum, but I also started like a mini um, campaign going around in my office <laughs> just telling people to vote to remain, literally, because that was my stance. And I guess a lot, a lot of the 
um, things that you guys have brought up, definitely it's kind of like the same situation for myself regarding the family. We travel a lot in Europe. I have a lot of family in France. And actually, have you, have you thought about it? Going to Amsterdam just to go loud, you can't, you can't be doing it. You can't just go there and just have yeah, a bit of no, a smoke okay. and, and chill. Why? Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, I can't say you can't go there because I don't know what, what the outcome is going to be. But I mean, regarding some of the impact of... It won't be uh, as simple of, as just booking a flight not, and then yeah, jumping on the yeah, flight. It, yeah. might, it might not be as simple as doing some of these things. So, yeah, I did, I, I did vote. And yeah, I voted to remain because I believed the EU, and I think we touched on it slightly in one of our conversations, even regarding the judicial system and some of the laws that governed like the UK. Mm-hmm. I, th- I thought those were quite useful for our... What's the, what's the thing? Not common, right? What's the, what's the basic level of... Um, you mean basic? human rights? You mean? Yeah, for yeah. Our human rights. I thought that they were very critical for us to be part of the EU because of that. I, f- I felt like it protected those kind of issues. So, yeah. Right. What about I, you then? I don't take any pride in saying this, but I didn't vote in the referendum and the reason why I did not vote in the referendum was because at the time I found a lot of the messaging from the government and from the opposition very confusing. I wasn't entirely sure on what the benefits um, were of leaving the EU. I wasn't also re- com- I mean, I, I was slightly aware of the benefits of remaining, you know, such as the free movement um, of, of, of travelling. And that was probably the greatest benefit I reaped from being within the EU because um, I travelled in and around Europe and, you know, it was as simple as just booking a ticket and jumping on a flight. I'm not entirely sure what the arrangements will be now, but putting that to one side, I wasn't entirely sure of what the other benefits would be um, to remain in the EU. And what what I had to realise is the UK had been in the EU for about 47 years, so that's all my life. I know I knew no different. You know, all of us knew, knew no different. We're all in our 30s. So we didn't know what life was like, you know, outside of the EU. And I'm pretty sure that, that the objective at the time the UK entered the EU was completely different to whatever objective the UK have in this present day. And so, as, because I found the messaging confusing, I wasn't entirely sure, you know, I didn't feel like I could make an informed decision. And as a result, I didn't vote. Some people may say that's not a good enough reason and you probably should have voted to remain um, if you weren't entirely sure, because if you weren't sure, then, you know, you remain with the status quo. But for me, I I didn't want to just necessarily follow that course of action. There were people around me who voted to stay, to remain. And even when I would question them and ask them, why should we remain? What what are the benefits? Some people couldn't give me a proper answer. They really couldn't. You know, as far as they were concerned, it was, you know, it, it was the norm. It was what they knew. And, you know, a lot of the um, things that were flowing around was, was more or less travel, you know, because I don't think anyone really understood whatever else would take place. I think if you worked in a certain industry, yeah. leaving the EU may very well have had effects on that particular industry. And so you may have seen it from that particular perspective. But for me, um, I, I just, I just, just wasn't sure. Just to add to that, though, I think when, when we look at the... When we look at that, during that period and some of the information that we were being fed, I felt that most of it was more gained towards leaving the EU. And even when, when the conversation around leaving the EU, there was a lot of it around the whole immigration and yeah. how some, some, we have some of the stuff that Ali touched on, we have control of our borders. Plus, there was this mention about the NHS, uh-huh. and then there was a mention about this amount of millions that we're going to save the minute that we leave the EU. Yeah. And then there were conversations about social housing, about all these issues that we have in our communities with not having enough housing because there's a lot of people coming in. This was what I felt like the agenda that was put forward by the Leave campaign was very skewed in regards to it actually being factual. Uh-huh. And yeah. To- that's true. And to touch on that point, I don't think we, we, we had any guarantee what agreement we would get when we left the EU. There was no guarantee they were going to agree to half the stuff that was being pushed in the agenda. And, and for me, I, I was probably someone who did believe or agree, you know, if there would have been a second referendum, I'd have voted. I certainly would have. <laughs> and I, and, I, and I, I felt like there should, I, I felt like there should have been a second referendum. No, there shouldn't I, be. 
Let me tell you my reasons okay, why. Yeah, I'll tell because you why. I, because I, I felt as though when we voted, we didn't necessarily know what the terms and conditions were for leaving the EU. We knew nothing about that. Once the agreement was made and we knew what those terms and conditions were, then that should have been put to a vote to the public. Question, because then, on that point, you understand exactly why you're leaving. Okay, but and question what, or what so will I happen there after. I, I was yeah, going yeah, to come in before that. No, 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 no. no, no, no. No, no, I, I wanted to come in and okay, hear so okay. I have to come in. No, 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 get... <laughs> no cause the reason why I say that I don't th- there's no reason why there should be a second referendum. So you know you ma- you mentioned the point of David Cameron. The yeah. reason why David Cameron had to call for the referendum because it was in the it was in the coalition the, government agreement. It was part of the you know part of the manifesto. It was mm-hmm. part of the manifesto. So when he was um when he was not the actual prime minister. This was something that they were pushing in their manifesto to say, if they come into power, they will come call a referendum on the EU. He came into power and he realized it's not going to be that, that easy. But then people start questioning him on it. You said you're going to call a referendum, call a referendum. Yeah. So he had no, he had no choice but to do that. That's it the reason forced. why he, he stepped aside, because he yeah. was like, I'm not for this, but I understand it's something that I need to do. But anyway, going back to the point that, that, that you mentioned about the second referendum, I think the second referendum will bring more confusion than the first one, because... You live in a, in a so, sort of democrat, democratic state, right? Mm-hmm. And in a d- democratic state, the people make a choice, right? So if the people have made a choice, whether it's 51, 49, or whatever the That's percentage the point, yeah. is, you have to, to adhere to that, yes. yeah? And the problem that you might have is that if you call a second referendum and then the Remain campaign are the majority, yeah. the Leave campaign are going to be like, we need to call a third referendum. Yeah, because it's not. <laughs> so so where do you, what I'm just trying to say with that, it's not that... You're not right in what you're saying in regards to where we'll be and people being a bit more informed and all, all those kind of stuff. But then you're also going to have the other side that's going to say, if we call the referendum on the first one and we've called another referendum, then we need to do a third one. Because, and then the question will be, where do you draw the line? Yeah, but, you, right, right, touch, 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 let, me, let me... Wait, wait, hold on. on. Right, Touching bases on that, both of what you guys are saying, it all, it's all add up, it makes a good point. But what should have happened is people would have seen the, ref, the refer, referendum... Right? And touch on base on the, the agreement, no one should have voted unless they've given an actual tangible evidence of why, what it is. I think the mistake that we did, we went to go and vote, not realizing what it is. Some people, like for example, Cam, you didn't vote because you didn't have a clue what was in that, right? In the referendum. The, the thinnest. So people should just know what you're coming in. No, 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 no based on the information they were given, and that information is incorrect, then there is, what you, what do you call it? It's, um, oh, I forgot what the word I used for it, but you know when it's like there's been some kind of manipulation, basically. Um, so I think those are grounds for a second referendum based on the misinformation. Because if there's people are being lied to... There's, there's misinformation. That's what I'm trying to say. Then, no one should have voted. I don't, I don't know why. There's misinformation yeah. in politics all the, the time. time. Yeah. yeah, there are people that have said stuff but, in their manifesto and they yeah. never stick to it. And they still That's go along. misinformation. And and they still so I don't think that is a good enough grounds for a for, for, second. For, for, for a second referendum. Now we talk about doing that period, and you mentioned the thing about having that information. Yes, there were like debates and all sorts. You had like the Leave campaign, the Remain campaign, yep. and they were there to whether or not that information is useless or whether inf- whether or not that information was not actually talking about what exactly was meant to happen. I yeah. just feel like that's part and parcel of the politics that we live in. That's I don't it. agree with that point because I don't think just because, because it's happened before in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, happened yeah, before. Yeah. That's not a justification to say yeah. it's, it happens all the time. So that's the reason why we shouldn't have the second referendum. No, but, yeah, no, but, but, but have, why didn't you do your research then? No, what, what, comes, what, comes, what comes to and that person? What was the no, no, to your because research? this is the stuff in it. You have to understand the m- mainstream media in regards to pushing stuff on, 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 on people for them to feel and think a certain way. Yeah. And this is what, what was done. Yeah. In regard to the Leave campaign, as I kept on saying, it was more driven down the whole idea of immigration than anything else. That's it. You have yeah. a lot of people from whatever class that they come from mm-hmm. that were voting just based on immigration. immigration. And Nothing na- else. And na- na- yeah? Farage, so what, what, when we're saying that, and what I'm trying to say here is that you always have the media and the media have an agenda and they'll always push that agenda forward. 
in whatever walk of life, if you don't do your personal research, yeah. you cannot put the onus on your politicians to give you that information. And yes, on one hand, you're saying, yes, you can't qualify that. Fair enough. But the history will tell you that politicians have lied to us over, over and over again. Yeah. Weapons of mass destruction. Where is that now? Shouldn't Bush and, and Blair be in prison right now? They should have. Come on, what are we talking about here? What are we really talking about right here? That's yeah. what I'm trying to well, say. Well, you believe these same people that lied to you and how many people are dead now? And, 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 and then we're saying that for our referendum, we should have a second one. Because no. in the second on, one I saw, you could have people that are still lying to you. There was no, there was no referendum for the war, though. Of course just there was so no know. referendum because no, they pushed it, it through. Yeah. For the war, if you want to talk specifically about it for the war, yeah. they put the public in a situation for them to make, to make us feel so that they have to, to do this, that yeah. there is no point trying to even have a, a conversation about this. Yeah, yeah. They, this they, is they, something they, that they, has they, to the be done. Yeah, yeah, but do you know how many that's rallies that's and marches there were against no, them going ahead, even though he still went ahead? You don't understand the point that I'm trying to make. Whether you made rallies or not, because in this conversation that we're talking about, you had the Leave and Remain campaign. It's literally split down the middle. So yeah. you had people that were still unhappy about whatever decision that was being made. Yeah. The point that I'm trying to make is that regardless of that, that war, whether there were rallies or not, that war still went ahead. It has to. And then it came out I, that I there was that, no... I feel it's not a good example because there was no vote for that war. If you can give me an example of something that no, went ahead... No, what he's saying is the lie. No, 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 the lie part. No, 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 this is what I'm saying. This is yeah, what they don't get. Yeah, you're yeah, talking about a, a vote. Yeah? We're not talking and about a vote. you're talking about the reason why that vote should have never happened because the basis of it were lies. Lies. This is what my point is. Because you were like, you were misinformed. So if you have the right information, and that's what's just based on what Cam said, if we had the right information, then we should have a second referendum. That's it. And I came about and I said, forget about the misinformation, because we are misinformed all the The time. time. And I'm using these examples to support my argument. So my argument is not about calling the referendum. No. My argument was about you saying calling the referendum based on lies. And yeah. I'm saying that the politicians have been lying to us over and over again. So you should not be taking their word for it because it's been proven that they've lied to us. That's yeah. why I use the weapons of mass destruction. That's it, Tony yeah. and Bush. I guess one, I guess another example of a referendum is the it's poll true. tax with Margaret it's Thatcher true. in the 80s. Let's do this. We split yeah, in the yeah. middle now, yeah? Yeah, yeah. We yeah. are here. Let's do this. Yeah, it's me and Ali, man. Yeah. No, it's I don't true. even try. I was listening. I understood it. But... No, one, one, one example is the poll yeah. tax with the referendum in yeah, the, yeah, the 80s yeah. and, and Margaret Thatcher put that in place and, you know, people were completely opposed to that. You know, there were mass protests as a result of that. Mm. And as a result of those protests, it was replaced with the council tax in mm. the end. You know, that's an example of, you know, a referendum going ahead, but the, the majority my, sort my, of... But I, go- I get what you're saying. I want to come back to what Kodja was saying about the misinformation. Okay. <laughs> yes. Wait, wait, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Look, I agree <laughs> oh, with what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, yeah? But I feel what you're saying is true in terms of, yes, there has been a long history of misinformation and things still going ahead. Yeah. I think then, isn't there now reason or cause to now set a whole new precedent whereby if going forward um, politicians are misinforming the public... Don't get it twisted. We will find out whether that is true and that has affected a certain population of voters and we will do it all over uh, again. Can I, can I add into that? <laughs> That's what I mean? mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I mentioned. They will be now reluctant to keep doing that because but, they know it will get what, pulled guess back what? again. That's what I mentioned. Yeah. That's what I mentioned from the very first start. When we had this referendum, we shouldn't have voted in the first place until we know the truth. But everyone was so scared based on the immigration. Now, now, Nigel Farage just came in and, and murdered the situation. The media it, didn't even come so and murdered the situation. Everyone got scared. It was a scaremongering, just like the Tony Blair and, 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 and to Bush. That that's piece, exactly yeah? what is happening. And that's what, that's that. what is happening all the time. You need to understand. Yeah. So just, just touching back on what you said, uh, yeah. Mo, and what Ali said. There are conversations being had about politicians, holding politicians accountable for the lies that they spin in the public domain. Yeah. Now, I feel like that's a separate thing. We need to hold our politicians accountable. As a law needs to be passed to say, before you go out there to say some of these things, it needs to be based on some sort of factual evidence. Yes. But then we need to understand this, though. I've done statistics. Mm-hmm. With stats, you could choose any part of that number mm-hmm. and just push that part forward. Yeah. Yeah? So, so even though you could say that whatever that they're putting out there needs to be based on some sort of factual evidence or it needs to be facts, in statistics world... Any part of it could be stats. So it's, nece- it's not necessarily going to paint that clearer picture that everyone needs to be informed in order to make a decision. But as you did say, it will put us in a better position to move forward. Yeah. And I feel like that's something that needs to be in place. But if that's not in place, 
all these conversations saying that we've been misinformed and we've done one thing and if we had the right information, we'll not do another thing. I just feel like it's the, it's the democratic um, governance that we live under. That's what democracy is. Guys. Yeah, and they play on that. No, 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 yeah, I agree with you. But the, but the thing is, but, but, but just by accepting that, oh, because I, this always happened this way, yeah. oh, we should just continue. No, I agree. That is where I'm can like, we, no, we, no, no, no. Let's no, start no, then no, from... Yeah. Can we, can we move forward? on, guys? Can no, we move on? Okay. Perspectives, different views, one voice. What is the definition of Brexit? What do you mean? What's, it's, it's, it's the UK leaving the EU. We know that. No, no. <laughs> no, don't, no, don't, no. Don't do that. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> Don't the no. The reason why I asked that, what is the meaning of Brexit? Obviously, it's the UK leaving, but what was the meaning of the Brexit? What was the reason? Okay, all right. Okay, That's I, what I meant by that. What do you mean? So you're kind of saying, what does Brexit mean to each individual? Or are you saying the whole? Because. Oh. It means a lot of things to different people. Yeah. No, but that's not what he yeah. means, though. What do you mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, what I'm trying to no, say. No, no, don't try to say what <laughs> Don't try to jump one. your question. No, no. Oh, what do you mean, I'm brother? saying, yeah, what is the... Okay, the, the, the definition of Brexit is to leave... Is the UK to, UK to leave um, um, the, the Europe, right? But what yeah. is the definition of the whole Brexit itself? Like, like the, the terms on the ground, obviously, the Brexit was established since the 1973, right? I guess, I guess it... Brexit, you mean the European Union was yeah, established, European, established yeah. in 1973? Yeah, but yeah, so I guess really, it's just like the point that I can make. Yeah, yeah. It just the whole means, thing, Brexit is literally <laughs> leaving the EU. Yeah. In regards to the terms and conditions and stuff, that's part of the conversation mm. now. That's where we are now, where they need to decide whatever, what does that actually mean yeah. for, 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 for us now. I guess, I guess, I guess the, the agenda that's been pushed is that it means independence for... Um, for for UK, yeah, whatever you know, whatever that's meant. To yeah, be. whatever. Yeah, that, <laughs> people that, were celebrating on Friday. That, yeah, exactly. You know, it's independence. It's the UK being an independent state and being able to set their own agenda going forward and not necessarily be shackled. No, but then, by... <laughs> there is there is a thing in that. There is a view in that because and this is me playing a bit of a thinking off from the others with the other foot on. In regards to when you have this um, kind of pyramid kind of structure huh? where you have like rules being set. Yeah, so if you can imagine we're all like four different households mm-hmm. and we have some sort of um, another upper layer above us mm-hmm. and you have other upper layers above us and they set rules for all our households. Yeah. But all our households are not the same. Like I have how many children? Some of you don't have children. Some mm-hmm. of you only have one. Mm-hmm. So one, one size doesn't fit all, if you get what I mean. So I need to have some sort of autonomy for my household to set what I feel is best for my household. Mm-hmm. So if you look at it in the case of the e- 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 UK and the e- in the EU, mm-hmm. UK are kind of feeling like a lot of these things that you're setting, that's not, it's not of a benefit to me, to my household, if you want to use that household as an example. Yeah. So i rather have that freedom to dictate what happens in my household. And I guess that's what people might have been celebrating about to say, now, just added to the point that you made, now we have this kind of all sorts of this freedom somewhere yeah. to, to, to do whatever that we, we want to do. But what's the freedom kind of though? What is the freedom? Because as you, as as Cam mentioned, you're not shackled by the EU laws. You could or but rules or whatever. But that's the, the human government. rights side of it, no? But there's so many that's different one sides aspect. of it. That's there's so that's many one different aspects, aspects of it. it. Yeah. So there's agriculture, there's all sorts. There's I get what you mean, and I think in general, I personally think a lot of the EU rules aren't that detrimental in terms of I, to the industrial state. No, 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 yeah, I, believe, um, I, 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 yeah. I personally, it's yeah, just the money um, side of it. And, is, and, and in the money side, the UK never joined the euro. So yeah. even in the whole... But why are they saying, why are they saying they, they're giving the, EU, the EU quite a lot of money each year, over a billion pounds? Or oh, the stuff they said about the NHS. Everyone's still trying to chase where that money or the NHS went. <laughs> no, but, but, <laughs> no, no, but the thing is, you guys have to understand, <laughs> yeah. Michael... Nigel Farage, the day that we the, the the results came out, he literally came on TV going, "Oh no, I didn't say that." He started retracting all those stuff he was saying about the NHS and stuff like that. And he, and then what he was saying is that Boris Johnson was part of that. Yeah, and then he was saying that he doesn't know where that money will go. I do, I <laughs> I do remember David Cameron talking about how much money the UK contributes to the EU budget, and it yeah. was a lot. At, you no, know, it that, is, that, it that, is a lot of money. <laughs> And that was one of the... Re- I think that I was think one of the I think that's the main reason why people are scared. I mean, wanted to come out of the EU. Nah, I think it's the immigration. Money. But, but, but contributing, it does help the UK as well. Of I don't course. think they were giving money and it wasn't coming Nothing back. Nothing was coming yeah. back. Like, I deal with um, charities that 
do the whole employment, what? unemployment deal with employment in the whole of the UK, yeah. and a lot of it's funded by the European well, Social. Hold on, mm. you tap into I, immigration. Yeah, I know. I, I, I know there was an agenda about jobs as well, about people that you know. And this is me. This is now we need yeah. to talk about that yeah, because yeah, it's very, very, yeah. very, yeah. very, very this, interesting. And part. you know, obviously, like disclaimer, the, I don't. You know, I'm not saying I agree with these views, but I know there were talks about people saying that people from the EU would come to the UK and take those jobs, which. Um, British people felt like were reserved for them and they were being taken by those people migrating from the from countries within the EU and taking those jobs. That that was but an agenda that was no, being no, pushed I, out. I, I, t- I totally agree. And that, that, that was why this whole EU thing was extremely fascinating because mm. it wasn't... It wasn't When people say it was racist, yeah, there could be little racial elements to it, but I don't necessarily think there was like a class kind of issue um, and, and, uh, um, going on as well. And the reason why I say that is because... I watch black people talking about, yes, we need this. Immigration is over the hill. People are taking our jobs and stuff like that. And then when you kind of like listen back to say people are taking our jobs, what type of jobs? Yeah. yeah? So you look at the low skill jobs, as you mentioned, yeah. where you don't need any kind of qualification or any kind of thing to enter those kind of jobs. Those kind of jobs at some point were reserved for the people that migrated from Commonwealth, wherever it is. And yeah. essentially it was that black people that are doing these jobs. Now, even when you look into construction, construction could be for the working class white families yeah. that don't have any degrees and they go straight into that and build a career off for themselves. Now, what happens is that when you have the EU population coming in and they know a lot of them that are lower skilled knows that they could just get into this job straight away. Yeah. So one thing that it does is that it provides, there's more, dem- there's more supply, to supply and demand, I'm thinking about my, my economics. So there's more demand in the market regarding the workforce. So if I have a construction company, Mm -hmm. there's so many people I could pick from, right? So if you do have that as well, then what that affects is it affects wages and salaries, right? Because instead of me, if I had like, let's say the working class, white families working there, I know that year on year and I need to bump up their pay Mm -hmm. because they'll be like, no, no, it's under. But if I have a lot of demand, I could choose from so many different people Mm -hmm. that are prepared to take that job at a lower level. Plus, because of where they're coming from, they might work, people use the word harder mm. in whatever context that's meant to mean. It's but I'm not just quote, saying. Slap, <laughs> yeah, quote, unquote, yeah. Quote, unquote, yeah, <laughs> whatever that's meant to mean. So when you look at that bubble and the reasons people were given to leave the Brexit, it wasn't just the white racists sitting in their room, they don't like black people, they don't like um, foreigners coming into the country that were just saying you leave. You also had, I had an Asian person, I went to one conference in Westminster. And I think it was David Lummy and some other people were there. And I had this Asian person standing up and saying, no, no, it was about something about London, whether London should be an inclusive city. And they were, it was around the whole Brexit um, kind of idea. And this Asian person said, no, like, why should they be thin? They need to leave our country. Obviously, leave our country because he's a UK citizen mm-hmm. and he sees anyone else that's coming in. I said, and that was the first thing that my eyes were actually like, oh, okay, raw. Right. So this conversation, you actually have people from... <laughs> <laughs> actually on, 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 you know what I mean? So it's not just about... It was about immigration, but then immigration, not just on that racist agenda of immigration, but on different kind of levels on social class as well, I felt like. Yeah, but what, what is the terms of the immigration? Are they saying the terms of the immigration is more of the Australian... System. Well, the point system, the Australian yeah. point system. Well, no, no, that's it's funny you say that because come, come, we had a separate off, off, yeah. offline conversation yeah. and come. So yeah. I'm waiting for you to bring that. Yeah, that, that Australian I, 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 I point based care- system. Yeah. I will be careful how I, you know, how I delve into this topic because I don't want it to come across as uh, too, too spicy, too, too controversial. Nah, but bring it, man. <laughs> say how it is. Say how but, it is. Man. Yeah. So, I, so what's what, your so, view? What's your view so in the what, first place? Like, okay. do you, do you so I, 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 I think immigration is a good thing. I think it's a good thing for the EU. I think it's, I, I have no issue with the free movement of people amongst, across but the EU. But you feel like it needs to be kind of like monitored or it needs to be somehow have some sort of control and you feel like the point-based system will give some, it that Some control. people, that, well, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily feel that way. I can't say I feel that way. What I can say is I've had conversations with some people and there have been, and I'm not going to name any names, but those conversations have bordered on the fact that there has to be much more of a restriction on migration, yeah. especially because some people, you know, because there isn't necessarily a control who's coming in and out of the country. As, as I said, because of the free movement of people within the EU, people from 
countries within the European Union can just cross the borders into the UK and they don't even necessarily need a passport. So nothing's being, you know, I don't know how things work when they cross the border, but they can just come in with an ID card. And and there's no, you know, there's no system to monitor or check if they're, if they're getting jobs or anything of that sort. I know some of them will come and then, you know, they'll do, you know, unskilled work, you know, for payment. But then there's also Sorry, the other side of say, those. Is, is it a problem just having an ID card to move about? No, it's not a problem. I don't think there's an, I don't think, not a problem. It's no, an ID, it's like a passport. But like I said, I don't know what the specifics are when they cross the border. I know, for example, if I go, if I'm traveling to France, if I've driven to France, um, I know there will be checks at the border for your passport and that's it. And then, you know, you just go. And I think it probably would be the same thing with an ID card yeah. if you come in, come into the, to the UK. But then there will also be those people that push the agenda that some of, some people, and as I said, this is a disclaimer because these are not my views, but, there will be some people who will come into the UK and, you know, may get caught up in, in, in organised crime and commit offences of that sort. And I don't not have st- statistics, so I can't say what portion of people migrate from the EU commit crimes or get involved in organised crime. And I'm not saying that, that you know, a, a lot of them do. I'm just saying that these are opinions and discussions I've heard from other people. And because of that there needs to be a tighter grip on migration because there's no control of how many people are coming in and leaving. Um, there's no checks that are being undertaken. But so so you, could have, you could have people coming from another country who have criminal records or have involved in crime in their country and then come to the UK and there's no checks being done on that system. Whereas if a points-based system, there would be much more stringent checks on people's backgrounds, um, from from wherever country they're migrating from, so you'll know a bit more about them before they can just migrate to the UK. Um, and but I swear, I swear there was a there was a check. I swear the, they mentioned that there was a check of knowing how many people coming in and out. But I'm talking about more checking people's backgrounds, but not how many people are coming in. I see. I, so there was rephrase that. So we, what I no, remembered, I there was a check. There is a check of how many people come in. No, what Ali, yeah, yeah. So what Ali is saying is that uh-huh. they might know how many people are coming, coming in, in and out. Uh-huh. But, but I guess what you're saying is that even though you might know how many people are coming in, in and out, you don't know the background of the people that are coming in and out. Yeah, I guess yeah. it's yeah. what you're yeah. trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Now. Yeah. I think I think when you mention the point based system, it's an interesting stuff because mm-hmm. um, I kind of just had a bit of a I've put my Brexit hat down and I've just had enough. So I don't really follow it anymore in all honesty. Yeah. But because of this conversation, I kind of dug into a bit of research. And there have been a lot of politicians pushing for this point-based system, similar to what Australia have done. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there were conversations around Australian ministers actually talking about it's not necessarily like a like for like that the UK just have to copy what Australia have done mm-hmm. because Australia is predominantly looking at economic kind of migration. Mm-hmm. So their point-based system is based on getting more people into the country for economic reasons, yeah. if you yeah. get what I mean, yeah, right? Yeah. So that's what their point system is based on. So they were saying in regards to the UK, if you want to have a point-based system, then you need to actually kind of tailor it for what the UK issues are, not necessarily just planting it there. Yeah. But then that point-based system kind of like puts an interesting thought in my head regarding if you apply it to the Caribbean or to Africa, right? And in the sense of if, even if you're looking at it from an economic kind of mm-hmm. gains kind of system, we know first of all that when their generation, um, our parents' generation or the generation before, when they came here, regarding their qualifications or anything like that, it didn't mean nothing in this country. No. It still does not mean anything in this country. Yeah, this right? Day, yeah. So when you're looking at a point-based system based on economics regarding your skill set, the level that this person is at, mm-hmm. how do we apply that to these African and Caribbean countries when the actual qualifications do not mean much? Yeah. Are you with me of, yeah. of what I'm trying to Because you could be a PhD, you could be whatever that you are in your country. When you come here, it's not necessarily the same thing. Yeah. So no. when I look at this point-based system, I'm always looking at who loses out here. Mm. And for me, straight away, I'm being a bit fishy thinking, look, black people are going to lose out here. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. But then, then add to your question about the qualification, it does mean something to the Africans because... No, but if, I'm not talking about Africans. No, I'm talking about the UK. The the UK. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So in Africa, you could have all... all no, 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 no. no, 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 no. Back. What I'm saying, within the African... No, wait, 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 just, just to draw it back, because yeah. obviously, I understand you want to touch, touch on the Africa topic, but we're talking about 
They move more specifically. Okay, okay. Brexit, all right, yeah. all right. We'll touch him back. For for my for my understanding, when we're talking about this um, Australian um, immigration law, what is the terms that Australia have that for the for our viewers and the listeners to understand? What do they have? Because this Brexit movement, whatever it is, is mainly primarily for the for the immigration side of it, right? No, it's not mainly. Not for mainly. Part, it's, it's not mainly. It's part, part pushed. Of it. It's yeah. partially pushed. of it. Partially of it, right? Because for me, I know we know uh, me and my missus. We know an Australian um, citizen. Um, not Australian citizen. We phrase that. We know a United um, a UK person that wanted to go to Australia, just stay there, and start um, having the um, the passport and everything, and work there. So from what she mentioned to my missus, the, the, the terms what Australia wanted for you to be accepted to be part of Australia, first of all, you have to have about over 2,500 in your account. And then you have to have a degree and certificate. And you have to have a letter that wherever I'm going to, I have to prove that, yeah, I've got accommodation. I can allow you to come in. And then on top of that, you have to apply for the, um, for the visa. So if you don't have those, no. Apply for the visa, and then on top of that, the company that you're going to work for, you need to have a letter written by the company that you've applied and you've been accepted. And mm. so that means what about five points? Mm. So if you don't have those things, five points in a in a Australia, you can't go in. Yeah. yeah. So, so is that what they're trying yeah, so to? So they focus on the economics. So yeah. it's like you as the individual, what yeah. you add into the country, what yeah. you bring That's into it, the, the value, country, yeah. the value that you bring into the country. Yeah. But then I think <laughs> for me, we've had like two conversations. And it always seems that we're using either statistical information from Australia when we're talking about the Nigerian, I think our last episode, about <laughs> what, what the Home Office class has, you being able to go back to your country. And mm-hmm. then the Home Office mentioned some statistics that the Australia had carried out or whatever not. And we're talking about this when we're talking about point system from Australia. And I feel like you have to be careful because what's Australia built on? I can't keep saying this. Australia is a racist country yeah. that has been built on getting rid of Aborigines. That's Their it. whole aim Ain't was to distinguish a whole mm. native people that belong to that region yeah. in order for them to build on top whatever that they, 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 they're doing now. Yeah. So, of course, everything that they're going to be doing is a bit loaded, if you ask me personally. Okay. I feel like mm. everything that they do in that country is loaded because till now they're not even recognized as a people in that country anyway. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're right. So you have to think when we're always pushing forward and we're looking at other systems that are working and you use Australia, for me personally, alarm bells start ringing <laughs> because of what, what that country is about. Um, Mo. But that point-based system is an interesting one. Though. It is, Mo, it Mo. is. And, and, and I guess we'll, once again, that's something to you know, keep your eye on after the transitional period to see where the UK takes that, mm. that policy going forward. Perspectives, different views, one mm-hmm. voice. There's one thing I was talking to more about. Mo, we were mentioning about dual, dual um, citizenship, citizenship, right? Yeah. Is that something that is going to, obviously, is going to affect Brexit? So no, it won't. Some people or not, would it? I know there's been a, I think it's like 300% increase in dual citizenship oh, applications. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But with that, so to apply for dual citizenship, it's applied to your birth country to grant you the dual citizenship. Um, so let's say if you were born in the UK, you'll be applying to the UK so that you can have dual nationality. You could, you may already have a French passport or a German passport or Portuguese, another yeah. one of the EU countries. Yeah. But for you to legally be a dual citizen, yeah. you have to apply from your other country. Okay. Mm. So you might get a lot of people that will have two passports. They're traveling and then they might use the other one. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Technically, that's not actually legal to do. Mm. You're meant to travel on that one same passport mm. that you leave with From, yeah. and arrive at or vice versa when you're coming back. So you might have some people that might leave on their UK but then arrive in Portugal on their Portuguese passport, mm-hmm. yeah. which is technically not correct. You're not supposed that's to do that. That's what we African have, does. Yeah. 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 Mm. But it's funny that you guys mentioned that because... With the, personally, the people that some of the people that I work with, I, I work with some um, one Polish lady, and around this whole Brexit, I kind of asked her if she was going to apply for a British <laughs> um, British citizenship. Yeah, and within that community, she yeah. said, "Yeah." So yeah. what what happened within that community? You had people that were like, "You know what? Enough of this," and migrated back to Poland. Yeah. Okay. And you have people that were actually thinking that 
I need to actually apply for the my citizenship here, before. Well. And I know a lot of yeah, same, people yeah. did, not just, I was just using a Polish as an example, but yeah. you, could, you could have migrants from Romania or whatever mm-hmm. thing, applying for actual um, citizenship. British citizenship yeah. because of all, all this Brexit and where... Because they don't want to be affected. On this uncertainty around it yeah. and how that could affect them. Um, just to add in, I do know some people affected by the whole Windrush stuff yeah. that um, have Jamaican nationality and didn't want to get their British citizenship. They wanted to just keep their Jamaican passport and obviously still work and stuff. But then what they've realised now with the whole Brexit and how they've toughened down on certain things is that you now lose access to a lot of benefits that you might have been um, obtaining before uh, because of... Even your, if you have leave to remain on your Jamaican yeah, passport. Yeah, even if you have leave to remain, you, you need to actually be a... British citizen or so, get dual nationality. So is that because okay. they've left the Brexit? The no, it's, it's, left... it's, 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 it's nothing to do with that. It's more in terms of what has been happening with Brexit has added to these certain yeah, situations. Yeah, like the human white. Right. No, like because that. what people yeah. do not understand, go on, Ali, you were saying Not something. the human white, right, no? The human right is a separate thing. So just even based on the rim rush and based on this whole... Um, Brexit, what people don't understand is that when all these things are happening, they are passing laws that will be affecting other marginalised communities, yeah. Yeah. as per se. So hence the reason why a lot of the times I was a bit shocked when I knew of a, uh, black people are doing that because I'm like, yes, I can understand from some of the stuff, the economic stuff that we've spoken about, the social class issues, mm-hmm. um, unskilled work, low-skilled work, and all that, what that kind of means for you. But then, on the other hand, I'm looking like it to say, if they do actually go ahead with this, there will be some things that will be stripped off you as well and you will not realise yeah, till yeah, like yeah. five, ten years down the line. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? So th- th- that, was, that was what I was just trying to say to people, that we need to really be informed ourselves to know the decisions that we're, kind of, we're making because oh all God. this information is not going to be out there like that. It's only after... Because we talk about the rim rush stuff. When it was actually happening, who knew about it? Not a single. Did the politicians <laughs> share it with anyone? No. Nope. This exactly. is what I'm saying. Exactly. So when we and, and it goes back to these politicians and the lies and us knowing information, don't you think something like that is something that they should have shared with everyone so that you know that if you're affected, you actually have some sort of period where if you don't do anything, you know that you, you, you do you know what I mean? This goes back mm. to the point why I said I felt like a second referendum should have taken place. No. Then you would have yes. known. No, yes. You would have known don't, what yes. the that, terms and conditions no, were to leave. I'm yes. using this example to show to you why that second referendum is not going to work. Because I'm saying to you, when these issues are actually going on, when these politicians are actually sitting in the dark corner, screwing people over... Does anyone get to know of it until four or five years' time? And, and, they don't and, talk to you about it. And, and the reason why it still carries on is because there's no consequences and accountability. Mm. No, but By us doing a second it, referendum no, it's, it's, and it's, highlighting it's, it's these who things. Who has the benefit of the consequences and those account... Or what did you say? And responsibility, you said. And it's, accountability. It's, it's, and accountability. For their purposes, it serves them right. Yeah. Do you think there was anyone in, in what? Downing Street saying, oh, you did a bad thing? No. It's just in the public domain. People will be, no, they don't think that. This is what you need to understand. <laughs> I'll be like to you, yeah, Mo, that was a good one, you know. You really stuck it to them. How many did we get out of the country? Mm. But when I see you in public, yeah, I don't know about what Mo did. I think <laughs> maybe in, in, in hindsight, we should have thought about this a bit more. That's what I would say. This is why politics work. So this second referendum, okay, so let's, let's, let's push this agenda of second <laughs> referendum. At one point, I just want to talk about what happens now? Because I watched one BBC program just describing yeah. where the stages yeah. of what yeah, so happens. That's what now we're going to do. We're going to really in and then talk about life after Brexit to sort of conclude. life after Brexit. Yeah. yeah. So j- just looking at this second referendum. Go so on. what happens Give it if me. you have that second referendum and you have like a what 55 45 split for Remain? Do you feel like the 45 percent leave should be happy with that result? Yes. What, what, well, Why? Look, well, look, 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 look. It. it it, could, it it doesn't so the second referendum doesn't even and, and it depends on how it's how it's phrased because it uh, might not even be a referendum on it's, leave or remain it's the first it could, real it, referendum it could, it could be a referendum on okay call it the real these, referendum these are the two agreements we have <laughs> you guys are these are the two agreements yeah. we have what agreements do you, do you want i'm just i'm just 
I'm, no, I'm but speaking, I'm saying no, speaking, no, no, no. I'm speaking no, no, hypothetical. No, no, no. Let's let me not be hypothetical. No, no, no. no, 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 no this is an actual exactly. issue. That's These going are on. Deep, no, let's people need to okay, understand this. So let's say so let's say they go they go to the EU, have discussions, reach negotiations. Oh, so you and, mean they have to have a deal? Yeah, and they have a deal, and they say these are the two deals we have on the table. Do you want deal A or deal B? I'm not saying it has to be a referendum on leaving or not. Because that's already been that's already taken yeah, place. Yeah, but then that but it deal, could be, it could that be a, leave, on, on the terms and conditions. If you have two deals from the EU, that's on a leave basis. I know. <laughs> so, I know. But I'm saying it. <laughs> so <laughs> you've actually skipped the remain and you just got to leave. Let's just get a resort and come back. <laughs> <laughs> you guys. No, 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 no. no All right, but, cool. I, I, I more want to talk about in terms of the blatant lies. In terms of money will be put here this way. Yeah. Even during the whole leave campaign, do you know how many articles there are about how terrible the NHS yes. is and all of this nonsense yeah, so to great. fuel mm-hmm. certain things? Those sort of subliminal, subconscious messages that were going out at that time is what fueled all this misinformation and agenda. It's a, it's a genius thing because when you oh do yeah no definitely when, when you do like marketing, it tells you right <laughs> learning about people's behaviour. So you look at the population and you look at the issues that affect them the most mm. or the issues that in the public domain, everyone's talking about that. Mm-hmm. NHS people are talking about that. Mm. Social housing people are talking about that. Mm-hmm. Immigration people are talking about that. So if I'm in the you leave just, camp, I'm like, how do I just tease jump up on my those message things, yeah. to just go along these agendas? That's what, how you, you misinform the public. What, and that's what, what they did. What, yeah. what I will say is, obviously, running a referendum was a sign of goodwill because they didn't have to. They could have agreed in Parliament to leave without no, having a referendum. But he did. His not arms was twisted no, behind not, his back. He had to. He had to. He yeah, did he not to, want to, to, but he had but, to. But, but, but what I'm trying to say, what I'm saying, I'm making a point that it wasn't even legally binding. And we know that because Gina Miller brought the, um, the challenge to the court and saying you can't just run, you can't just leave the EU based on the public vote. It has to go to a vote in Parliament. Mm-hmm. And obviously Parliament voted on the will of the people, given the, the results of the referendum. So having a referendum, as I said, is a sign of goodwill because legally they don't have to. Yeah, they, 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 they can put, to. They can put, put that vote. In a position exactly. that he couldn't mm-hmm. walk away from. Yeah, I yeah. agree with what you're saying. So, so the real referendum, not second, oh, not the third, referendum. the real <laughs> if referendum. If I'm in the leave campaign, I'll be like, the first one was the real <laughs> referendum. Me, the real one. <laughs> guys, you guys touching quite a lot of importance here. I was just listening about this, the effect after leaving Brexit, like NHS, for example. So, so when you say the NHS effect, is going to so, be the same, so nothing's going to happen. You want to touch on the effect after leaving Brexit, because yeah. then that's that's what we're going to talk about yeah. to conclude. So we can we can jump onto that point. Perspectives, different views, one voice. So I guess we're going to sort of wrap up and talk about our views and points on how we feel life will be after Brexit. Can I just touch on what that transition period now looks like? Sure. And yeah. what some of the dates are. Yeah. So obviously leaving the Brexit now. Um, UK have to actually negotiate with 27 different countries within the EU state now. Mm-hmm. Like literally <laughs> sit down with each of them to negotiate some sort of deal. Um, they have 11 months. I think you mentioned that yeah. till the, what, 31st? 31st of or December. Or the 1st of 2021 kind well, of thing. I look, well, everything takes effect. I know in terms of like free movement and, and everything. Yeah, so tariff-free, duty-free trade, that's still... It, it's in, it's 1st in, of January, 2021. Yeah, they still have access to the single market and the customs union. Um, there's a mandate which needs to be... So the EU needs to kind of um, put a mandate forward by the 25th of February mm-hmm. of where their stance is regarding negotiation. And then they would like to launch in the first week of March, not launch proceedings with um, um, UK. Um, there has to be like a, some sort of like process check. Like mm-hmm. I'm checking on you that that project was meant to be finished 11 months ago. Yeah. But I check in every so often. So they'll check in at June, in June just to see how mm-hmm. Britain are going on with their um, putting together their, their sort of proposal. And then by the 1st of July 2020, the UK could actually request for an extension. Yeah. So it could be a 12 or 24 month kind of extension for the if transitional, they, if, for period, the transitional yeah. period if they want to. Um, the UK deal, if they, don't, if they don't ask for an extension, the deal needs to be presented by the 26th November 2020 to every EU member state. Uh, I think every EU member state will have a vote on what UK presents, okay. if, if you get what I mean. Mm-hmm. So obviously, if no deal means that there will be some sort of border control and tariff and all those kind of stuff. But yeah, the, the last thing that um, the reporter kind of concluded is that these kind of major trade deals take years mm-hmm. to be put in place. In the UK, literally what, have what, months. What years? Like how many years you're talking? Uh, three, four. He just mentioned that oh. there are a lot of years okay. that takes for countries to form these kind of major trade deals. 
Mm-hmm. So even if we do have some sort of deal, there will still be some sort of negotiation ongoing okay. after the first uh, of January. Yeah. Yeah. So we're so we're gonna wrap up. Just talk about what our views are on life after Brexit. And I mean, I don't mind saying what my views are now. So I think we're in. Um, we're, obviously, we're in a transitional period, but we're, we're in untouched territory. Whereas we're the first country to leave the EU. So it's sort of, it's a, it's a learning experience for other countries because they're going to look and observe and see how things um, go with the Progress. UK. That's yeah, the, that's because the you don't know if these other countries are looking at the UK yeah. as sort of like, you know, the test, the yeah. test dummy to see where things go because it could create, um, it could have... Um, but just on that point, that's the problem for the EU yeah. in yeah. regards to the stance that they have with the UK. Yeah. Because if you're in that country, you're France, you're Germany, you're all these, but those countries are for the EU anyway. But if you're one of these countries that you're not really unsure where you are and you're looking at that deal and you're thinking they're getting a better deal, a lot more people want yeah. to leave the EU. So the main problem for the EU is to try to make sure that the UK is an example <laughs> so other people don't follow suit. That's that it. is a challenge that the EU but, have. But what about, what about those countries that aren't in the EU but like what, still benefit like, from it? No, is it Norway? So Switzerland's Some of one of them. Yeah. But I think, is it Norway? Well, Norway, Norway? They've got, Norway. Norway. They've got no, little Norway's backhand little well. agreements, you know, that they do, can't you? Wait, they they, they the wanted the back door thing, yeah? Remember the Theresa's May deal? Was yeah. to have that back door, was in Northern Ireland or yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and in the UK, it's like, no, we don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so when you're looking at some of these other countries, they have some sort of yeah. system that still agreement. gives them yeah. access to the yeah. single market and yeah. all that kind of stuff. And, and, and to go back to what I was saying, I think, for me, I think I'll definitely be hit hardest with the traveling because be, it'll be interesting to see how things um, pan out or manifest, you know, based on the agreements with traveling to other countries within the EU. I remember when I could go to France, Portugal, and, you know, because my mobile phone, you know, you have free roaming within oh, the yeah, EU. Yeah, roaming. Exactly. It's, like, it's, it's yeah. basically like going from one city to, you know, it's like yeah. going from one city in the UK to, to another, another yeah. you know, and you just use your phone. You can use Google Maps to navigate your way, but we're not going to have that benefit anymore. That's, that's, yeah. so you that's, could deal with one of them. Google Maps, download it offline. Yeah. <laughs> and then the whole European arrest, arrest warrant as well. That's yeah, that, that, go that, that's going to change. Oh, the whole think, Interpol and... Yeah, so I don't, I'm not entirely sure what UK's access will be to that system any anymore because... Well, they haven't negotiated it yet. Yeah, but. so the negotiations will take place in relation to that. I'm also interested to see how the UK transitions from... Um, obviously, we're not going to have the, the European Convention of... Well, the European Convention of Human Rights, I'd like to see how the UK sort of negotiates further deals and obviously the, the highest court of the country is the Supreme Court and so now people won't have the right to appeal to the European Court of Justice... You know, um, that's the part that, that was yeah. a bit thin about, as a result yeah. so the yeah. Supreme that's Court the really... will, will be the last um, court, court, court yeah. of appeal and it'll be interesting to see what effects and changes take place as I said this is not something that will change overnight it's you know this, it could take a whole decade but is there not like a see. general like human right bill that every country has to adhere to we've got a human rights act here each, okay so that, that act is for every country or no, no, each, each country for this, that's for the UK also oh, each country yeah. have to like put together their own kind of so, human so rights it's the, unique to you, their country you've got, you got the European Convention of Human Rights which you've got articles in there you've got article 6 of the right to a free trial article 8 right to um, private and family life but each country has sort of incorporated parts of the um, of, of the European Convention of Human Rights into their law, into sort of any legislation mm. that they pass. Obviously, the UK have the Human Rights Act, but at the same time, whenever the UK does pass legislation, they also have the principles of the European Convention of Human yeah, Rights. Yeah, to make whenever. sure that it adheres yeah. to that. Yeah. So what type of civil lib- liberties do we lose from leaving the EU then? It's hard. I mean, I'm not entirely sure. Obviously... Because we will lose something based on just even that explanation alone. Yeah, yeah so, I, I guess, so, so I guess we're making certain submissions and arguments in court. It won't necessarily be a case of relying on particular articles in the European Convention of Human Rights. Because but you kind of support right your, to. Yeah. But, yeah, but, so. but just, just to also mention, in terms of access to those courts or legal proceedings, in terms of our community, it's only really the upper class that generally access that stuff yeah because i know someone that applied to the whole european court and to get there you're spending 30 40 grand in legal fees and costs just to get there and obviously that money is given back when you win they pay back that money but initially just to even be able to get there 
is a difficult thing. But then I must say, it was funny now. This is really funny. And I don't even know why I did this. So I bought like a game. You get it. Let me just speed it up. I bought a PlayStation game and it was taking ages to download. It was taking days and I wanted to play the game as soon as possible. It was FIFA. And I was really pissed off that they didn't tell me how long it was going to take to download. So I wanted to like complain about Sony. So I was just looking. I couldn't find anything. And I found this European kind of... I had to send some sort of um, complaint to the European Union or whatever. Not. So I sent an email to them and then they got in touch with Sony. And so Sony had to then get hold of me directly. That was the only way that I was going to get any feedback from Sony about how poor the system was. Yeah. And I was thinking that was actually quite useful. And literally in that situation, all I had to do was find that email and send an email to them to say how badly I felt like I've been treated. Yeah. So, so obviously it depends on how we source this information. I totally yeah. agree that in regards to those higher courts, normally it's people that actually have a bit of a spendable income. Mm. But when were you actually looking at here? Because what, what, what was the, the thing that you used to get? You used to go to, where's those places that you used to go? They'll give you f- civil, is it, whatever. They'll give you like free advice and... Citizens, oh, citizens advice. advice Bureau. But that, most of them have been closed down now, haven't yeah. they? Yeah, that's yeah. due to that, that, funding, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's all dead now. So it's like, yeah, back to when, when we're looking at mm-hmm. how some of these things affect people, but that's got nothing to do but with it. But it's interesting, you touch on like big, even big corporations like Sony and other... Mm-hmm. Um, industries or other organisations that have sort of set shop up in the UK, be interesting to see how they, you know, continue trading going yeah. forward, given the fact that the UK has left the EU, because now, you know, in terms of trading and, mm. and their contracts, they don't have the benefit of sort of incorporating EU law yeah. into the contract that yeah. they're working in now, because UK that's a is good left. thing for the UK. Yeah, that's a good thing for the UK, so that they can sort of, mm. but then it, it's, it'll be yeah, interesting but- to see how those organizations set up shop like because there have been these kind of big um organizations actually moving their processing plants or whatever not yeah, to other to countries to other, yeah so when we say a good thing for the uk i could understand that it could drive um regarding um salary it could drive salary in regards to paying people a bit more because mm-hmm. you actually pay for skilled employment and it's not just you're going to, you're not going to have this demand um kind of stuff but i feel like in regards to actually job creation, what that could mean if some of these countries are, some of these big corporations are actually setting big head offices outside of the UK mm-hmm. kind of thing as well. Okay. Do you have anything to add? No, on? no. Uh, you wanna, anyone else want to? Um, what do you think? Life, life going break? forward. Life um, I think it's, honestly, I, I don't know what it will really be like. In the travel side of things, it's my big concern um, I know even things like pension. I don't know if some of you guys may have wanted to retire in Spain or Portugal or something. Oh. And there's a lot of British... It might be called an expat, so you might still make it. Well, yeah. the thing is, the UK, <laughs> so put it this way, you can still get your state pension paid to you if you're in an EU country. Um, when you're outside of it, that benefit is going to be lost. Oh. We don't know yet, though. Yeah, but true. Yeah. True, we don't. Uh, but I think the uncertainty in it is, is, is a problem if you're planning your future. <laughs> you want to plan something with some kind of certainty in that sense. Yeah, which, which makes the market a bit volatile. I think for me, I don't know. I, 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 don't know. I think yeah. a lot of us talk about the travel part. Yeah. But no. then I think this whole migration, immigration, whatever you want to call it, um, that in itself is going to be interesting as well. It's going to be interesting for the African states and the Caribbean states how this impacts them, especially if the UK introduced this point-based system as well, because I feel like it will be a negative impact, not necessarily a positive impact. But looking at some of the issues that are hand already regarding qualifications, what do they mean, and all those kind of stuff. Um, I think I actually heard of a phrase called, um, what do they say, jingoism? Has anyone heard of that phrase? No. So jingoism is extreme patriotism especially in a form of aggressive foreign policy. And I feel like in regards to where the UK are now, I feel like it's part of that where to be celebrating as if like you've gained independence, like, I don't know, I just feel like patriotism in the European countries is becoming more and more, um, is rising because every country so far, regarding the whole far right, kind mm-hmm. of agenda mm-hmm. and us having control of our borders and stuff i know people from poland that are talking about foreigners going into their country and that's very interesting in a sense that um they can say oh but this this area just used to be full of 
Polish people. Now I go there and it's just full of other things. These are the same kind of conversations that the people in the UK are having about Polish people. So that's, that, that in itself is kind of interesting mm-hmm. <laughs> with, with that happening. So there's kind of this kind of far-right agenda. But the, 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 the Brexit kind of thing, I don't know. I think we'll just have to wait and see. I guess for what I'm hoping for is for house prices to go down so I could buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> Ali, Hashtag you. real referendum. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag flexitarian. <laughs> Um, for me, um, it's not really about traveling. However, because traveling, most of us go to Europe. Maybe it's going to be a new changes now. We can go more Africa now and more part of the Asian side and um, ignore the, pa- the fact that we can, go, we can go more European side now. So it's more economic side for Africa now, maybe perhaps, and maybe Asia more. Um, it's so it's quite funny how UK. Point, it's quite funny how UK as. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, it's very it's very very relevant point. Like yeah. The UK might deal with other like um, will deal with other countries, especially might deal with Africa more because yeah. they don't have to necessarily have that U, EU kind of thing. Right. They'll have to branch off to yeah. have trade better trade kind of. Exactly. That's very that's, very that's very yeah, yeah. yeah. I never really uh, so open, open better negotiation negotiation deals yeah. for yeah. yeah. And then what I've That's kind why of Boris is spending on Africa now. Uh, we know. Um, also, touch base on what I've understood. What, what is find interesting that how UK has left the European after forty seven years. It's quite interesting how America has about fifty two states. Am I correct? Maybe fifty two states, and how it's a one country, but somehow each country has their own mayor, but it's a one law system. And if, for example, America decided every state, we're going to come out of the state with America, one government, and make our own government, how impact it will be for individual states. So if you look into European now, Britain is coming out of Europe. How in, what's the impact now is going to affect the rest of the European countries? So why would you, UK, go to that length to try and come out then you've got our borders such as scotland ireland and wales what is affecting them as well how is going to affect them as well and the way you wish you see it is that we are all one country especially north the 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 west especially ireland and all that we we should be one country and it's quite interesting how um, um, UK are trying to have the same system as Australia. I don't get it. I don't want to get it. I don't want to even accept it. As what Cold Show based um, put his facts on that Australia was it was not their country. It was just taken. And what's happened with the people that own Australia? So what is going to happen to UK in the next? 20, 40, 50 years when we're not in the um, European. Is it for us of a culture to get rid of I mean, UK to try and get off every other culture and make it Britain again, as what they will call it? Or is the working system going to be more you, um, Britain that is going to take effect? Because, for example, in my industry, 20% is directors and managers. Are we going to say the rest of it now, operative and labor, that's actually doing the grinding of the work? Are we going to say the, Europe, the UK are actually going to work? I don't see them going to work. I don't see them because I'll give you an example. When they're doing a road work, it takes them a good one year to finish a road work. But when another foreign country is doing a road work, it will take them literally three months to complete the work because in between they have so many breaks and they want more money. But that's one thing I've touched on. And um, for me, Brexit, I hope it benefit us within these decades, and especially for our profession that we have, we, both, we all have here. And perhaps the deals that they're going to have, as what they say, are going to take what, 11 months, maybe more, yeah? It, it is, it's not an impact to affect any of us, especially within the United Kingdom. So for me, I don't, I'm worried. That's my my honest truth i am worried because these caucasians or this this tory 
they have pushed this agenda to try and come out of the the the, the European so quick without without even realizing what is the impact for for all of us. Maybe it's just for their own benefit for themselves, or are they thinking about the rest of everyone else? One one thing I will add is now that I, I think. Since this referendum has, ever, has taken place, I feel like it's created one of the most divisive moments amongst, like, everyone in the country. Mm. Like, and, you know, it's been going on for such a long time. And now that it's all come to an end, I, you know, I'm, I, I hope that UK now, you know, this is an opportunity for the UK to come together and start to focus on the, on the issues that are affecting the UK on the ground, things such as violent crime, you know, um, lack of funding for, like, youth centres... And so many other things that are affecting communities. I think now, you know, yeah. people have been pushing this agenda, but certainly now more exposure and more um, and you know, more exposure can be sort of given to sort of these issues that are tackling the UK. Because for a long time, not much limelight has been given to it, given the, what, was, what has been happening with the EU negotiation. So thank you for listening this, to the LDM perspective. Um, we would really appreciate any comments. Um, and reviews um, you can catch us at our Instagram at LDM Perspective you can also email us at if there are any particular topics that you'd like us to discuss or address at ldmperspective at gmail.com so until next time that's us we're out yep peace perspectives different views one, one voice, voice.